Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 9 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled simply Living Wisely. It's ready for teaching on August 26. The author is John McVeigh and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word opens to us so many vistas of your love, your grace, but also that it shows us a good way to live. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. Let us, as we look carefully and walk with you, make wise choices, Lord. As we open your word, may it imbue our hearts and our minds with the direction that we need to go to follow you, because Jesus has already paid the penalty for our sins, and salvation, as we know, is free, but we, we, we can live for you. And uh, there is guidance here in this chapter 5 of Ephesians. Bless us, we pray. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Mary Lou in Alabama, for Joan Philip Gregory in Antigua, Audrey Walker in Jamaica, and Yelena Perez and her daughter in Dominican Republic, or Denzel and Nikita and Desi in the Bahamas, or Carl Johnson in Papua New Guinea, and Agatha Prince in Dominica, and Farouk Mohammed, and listeners in the Middle East, Mozambique, Zambia, Brazil, and Peru, and also those close to where I'm recording in Canberra, Australia, and Hamilton, New Zealand. Lord, as we open your word, may we walk closer with you. May our lives be such that others may wish to know who we know, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's read that again, Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Not long ago, a crystal jug was placed on auction in the United Kingdom. The auctioneers described it as a 19th century French claret jug, estimating its worth as about 200 US dollars. Two perceptive bidders recognized the jug as an extremely rare Islamic ewer. Its true appraised worth? Five million pounds, about 6.5 million US dollars. What allowed that bidder to walk away with such a bargain? The bidder knew something that the auctioneer did not, the true value of the jug. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, Paul contrasts what pagans and believers valued. Pagans valued a racy story in verse 4, a drunken party in verse 18, and debauched sex in verses 3 and 5 as the great treasures of life. Believers, though, know an ultimate day of appraisal is coming, when the true value of all things will become apparent, as we read in Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Instead of placing their bid on partying and drunkenness, they treasure, among other things, all that is good and right and true, as it says in verse 9, in Christ. 
Paul thus urges them to snap up the bargains found in Christ as they live, as we all do, on the threshold of eternity. As we read in our memory verse, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Sunday, August 20. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. In what sense does Paul intend believers to be imitators of God? Let's look at Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Paul urges the believers in Ephesus to walk in love, a call important to this section in Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. This walking in love, as we read in verse 2, is to be modelled after Christ's own love for us, as we read last week in Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you, expressed in his atoning sacrifice. Paul affirms four things about that sacrifice— 1. It is motivated by both the love of God the Father, as we've just read in verse 1 of chapter 5, and of Christ himself, as we read in verse 2. Let's read that again just to reinforce it. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. 2. It is substitutionary, with Christ dying in our place. Christ is no passive victim, but gave himself up for us. 3. Under the imagery of the Old Testament sanctuary service, Christ's death is also a sacrifice, which is made to God. And 4. The sacrifice is accepted by God, since it is a fragrant offering, as we've just read in verse 2 of chapter 5, but let's have a look at Exodus chapter 29, verse 18. And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. And Leviticus 2, verse 9, Then the priest shall take from the grain offering a memorial portion and burn it on the altar. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ephroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, then introduces a section expressing concern for sexual ethics. Let's read that in Philippians 5, beginning at verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The young converts in Ephesus are in danger of reversing their Christian calling and being drawn back into sexual behaviour that would negate their Christian witness. And we've got some texts to compare here. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 11. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. 
For I, indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with olden leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. And we also compare First Corinthians 6 verses 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And 2 Corinthians 12, verse 21, Lest, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before, and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practised. On the other hand, the Greco-Roman world of the first century exhibited the moral corruption and debauchery described elsewhere in the New Testament, as we read in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. And Galatians 5 verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. And Ephesians four seventeen to 19 This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness, and Colossians 3 verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For example, banquets of the wealthy regularly featured the behaviours Paul decries in Ephesians 5, 3-14, which we've read just earlier today. Drunkenness, ribald speech, risque entertainment and immoral acts. In addition, urban centres provided anonymity and permissiveness that fostered immoral sexual practices. On the other hand, many in that society lived virtuous lives and served as advocates for strict morality. 
When the New Testament provides vice or virtue lists and household codes, for instance in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, its authors mirror themselves in the wider Greco-Roman world. And those lists and household codes we read in Ephesians 5, 21 to chapter 6, verse 9, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good any one does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or or free. And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 through to chapter 4, verse 1, Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality." Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This world, at once debauched and virtuous, helps explain Paul's exhortations to avoid the immoral behaviour practised by the Gentiles, while wishing for believers to be circumspect in their behaviour, and so to earn good standing among outsiders. And so to finish today, in what ways are Paul's words about sexual behaviour applicable to your culture wherever you live? Monday, August 21, Walking as Children of Light Paul writes, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, in Ephesians 5 verse 6. Paul has identified those who practice various sins without shame or repentance, the sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, in verse 5. He has offered a blunt assessment, 
Those who are in Christ and destined to be participants in his future kingdom should not act like those who are not, as it also says in verse 5. He now worries over the effect of empty words. That is, believers might be deceived by explicit language into thinking that sexual sin is not taboo, or might even be drawn into such sins themselves. In verse 6, to be so deceived warns Paul, risks God's end-time judgment, the wrath of God that comes upon the sons of disobedience, as verse 6 says. The phrase, the wrath of God, is a challenging one. That it is the wrath or anger of God suggests a contrast to the usual moody human variety. And we're going to compare Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It is the just response of a long-suffering and righteous God against stubborn commitment to evil, not a crazed volcanic reaction to some minor infraction. Moreover, mentions of divine wrath most often occur in the context of inspired biblical warnings about the coming judgments of God. For instance, in Revelation chapter 6, where it reads... I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand? And uh, also in Revelation 16 and Revelation 19, God warns of his own coming judgments, an act of grace, since human beings are by nature children of wrath, as we read earlier in Ephesians 2 verse 3, subject to those judgments. Why does Paul exhort believers not to become partakers or partners with sinners? Ephesians 5, verses 7 to 10. And that reads, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Paul exhorts, walk as children of light in verse 8 and continues with a further command and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord in verse 10. The pagan seeks pleasure through sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, we read in verse 3. The believer's goal is dramatically different, not to please oneself, but to please God. As we read in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. And Hebrews 13 verse 21, Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And these texts use the same Greek word, eurestos, e u a r e s t o s, meaning pleasing or acceptable. The believer seeks to reflect the self-sacrifice of Christ. As it says in Ephesians 5 verse 2, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And so to finish today, what are some of the empty words that in our day and age we need to be wary of? Uh, 
Tuesday, August 22. Awake, O sleeper. Read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. What powerful warning is Paul giving here, and how does this apply to our present situation? Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 11, And having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. To understand Ephesians 5, 11 to 14, it is helpful to observe that Paul repeatedly offers two exhortations alternating between them. One, live a God-honoring lifestyle as children of light, as it says in Ephesians 5, verse 8. We'll also compare this with Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And verses 9, 10 and 11, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And verses 13 and 14, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And two, don't live a sexually immoral, God-opposing lifestyle, exhibiting, as it says in Ephesians 5.11, unfruitful works of darkness. And we compare that with verses 3 to 8, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, therefore do not be partakers of them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. We may mine the parallel exhortations in Ephesians 5, 8 to 10 in order to understand Ephesians 5, 11. Believers are to live before unbelievers as light in the Lord and children of light in verse 8. The whole point of doing so is to be seen, to make clear that, as it says in verse 9, the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Paul, then, is advocating a strategy of showing forth God's goodness. Believers are to expose the unfruitful works of darkness by exhibiting the righteous alternative for all to see. Meanwhile, we may take the challenging poetic language of verses 13 and 14 as Paul's daring assertion that believers, by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in verse 9, may win worldlings to faith in Christ. The Spirit is like light and reveals hidden things. But, as it says in 13 and 14, when anything is exposed to the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. When decadent living is exposed by the light, worldlings may see their behaviour for what it is. It becomes visible, futureless, and wrath-bound, as it said in verses 5 and 6, and experience a darkness-to-light transformation, for anything that becomes visible is light. The very change that Paul's Ephesian readers have experienced as believers themselves, who walk as children of light. 
What are we to make of the poem or hymn in Ephesians 5.14 which uses language associated with the resurrection of the dead at the end of time? Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And we compared that with Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. And verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. To issue a clarion call to awaken from spiritual slumber and experience the transforming presence of Christ. Since Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3, which Paul seems to reflect, is directed to God's people Israel, we may view the hymn poem of Ephesians 5.14 as a powerful appeal to Christian believers to awaken to their role as missionaries, refractors of the light of Christ in a darkened world. Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3 reads, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But The Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. And we compare that with Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, or laboured in vain. And Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. And so to finish today, how do you live the kind of lifestyle that can expose works of darkness for what they are? Wednesday, August 23, Snapping Up the Bargains Paul concludes Ephesians 5, 1-20 with two clusters of exhortations, Ephesians 5, verses 15-17 and verses 18-20, completing a section with sustained interest in sexual purity. The first cluster begins with the exhortation, Look Carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, in verse 15 in the ESV, restated as, in verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In between is a call to make the best use of the time, in verse 16. Consider Paul's exhortations to live in a way that reflects prayerful, discerning wisdom in Ephesians five fifteen to 17 What is the difference between walking not as fools, but as wise? Also, what does redeeming the time mean? Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In Ephesians, Paul has repeatedly used the common Old Testament metaphor of walking for how one lives. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, and in verse 10 in the same chapter, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And verse 17 of chapter 4, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And Ephesians 5, verse 2, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And verse 8, 
For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of the light. Here we, he uses the metaphor to encourage intentional discipleship. Just as you should watch your step when walking on a rough or darkened path, believers should look carefully then how you walk in verse 15. Because Ephesians 5.15 finds a parallel in verse 17, we may look there for a definition of what it means to live as wise people. We do not look within for wisdom. To be wise is to reach beyond ourselves to understand what the will of the Lord is in verse 17 in the ESV. Paul also encourages intentional discipleship with a vivid image. In the phrase, making the best use of the time, in verse 16, compare redeeming the time, Paul uses the verb exagorazo, E-X-A-G-O-R-A-Z-O, and we'll compare that with Colossians 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Drawn from the marketplace, it is an intensive form of the verb to buy and means to snap up the bargains on offer as we await Christ's return. Time here is the Greek word kairos, which describes a moment of opportunity. The time until the end is a promising period to be used to the full. It is also a challenging time because the days are evil, we read in verse 16. And we compare that with Ephesians 6.13, Therefore take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And Galatians 1 verse 4, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. And because the course of this world is dominated by the prince of the power of the air, as it says in Ephesians 2 verse 2. As believers look toward the return of Christ, they live in a difficult time, one that Paul portrays as a hazardous but rewarding marketplace. They are to be as attentive in their use of the time that remains as are bargain hunters during a brief sale that offers steep discounts. Though we can't buy salvation, the imagery is still apt. Take promptly what is offered us in Christ. Thursday, August 24. Spirit-filled worship. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, Paul imagines Christians gathered to worship. What does he depict them as doing in that worship? Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his final argument in Ephesians 5, 1-20, Paul urges believers to turn away from the mind-numbing use of wine and instead experience together the presence and power of the Spirit. Paul bans drunkenness, probably with a quotation from Proverbs 23, 31, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, suggesting he has in mind the injunctions against the use of alcohol, as seen in the wisdom literature of Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those that linger long at the wine, those that go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. 
At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies on the top of the mast, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? The evil things that come in the wake of drunkenness include crude, sexually explicit speech, mindlessness, immorality and idolatry, as you read in Ephesians 5, 3 to 14. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of those things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth." finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you Light. These are to be exchanged for thoughtful, spirit filled worship of God. Paul's exhortation to be filled with the Spirit is a key one that is modified by a series of verbs in Ephesians five nineteen to twenty one speaking, singing and making melody, giving thanks, submitting yourselves. Let's read those verses Ephesians five nineteen to twenty one speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord. Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Paul here applies the exhortation to be filled with the Spirit in verse 18. Corporately, imagining believers gathering in Spirit-inspired worship of God that nourishes unity, as we read about in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and that stands in contrast with egocentric pagan behaviour and worship, as you read in the first 18 verses of chapter 5. In this sketch of early Christian worship, musical praise dominates. It has been argued that the church was born in song, and this passage, together with Colossians 3.16, provides the best evidence for the claim. And let's have a look at that in Acts 16.25 and James 5.13. And so Acts 16.25 reads, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And James 5, verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. There is a horizontal element to worship since, in singing, church members are, in a sense, speaking to one another, as it said in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 5. However, the specific object of the musical praise is to the Lord, which, as indicated in Ephesians 5.20, identifies the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to compare that with Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The thanksgiving of Ephesians 5.20, described in parallel to the musical praise of verse 19, is to be offered unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, it said. 
In the phrase spiritual songs, the adjective spiritual, the Greek pneumatikos, highlights the role of the Holy Spirit in worship, since the term describes songs that are inspired by or filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul's sketch of early Christian worship then portrays all three members of the Godhead as active participants. And so, to finish today, how can you use music to enhance your own worship experience? Friday, August 25. Looking back at Ephesians 5, 1-20 as a whole, we watch Paul take a strong stance against sin and evil, especially in the form of sexual immorality and crude speech. He is unwilling to accept the presence of corrupt behaviour among the people of God. Instead, he calls the believers in Ephesus to a high standard of conduct and to embrace their identities as the beloved children of God and as saints or holy ones in chapter 5 verses 1 to 10. He dares to believe that when the Christians in community do so, they shine a light into the darkness, drawing their neighbours away from self-defeating lifestyles and into God's grace and truth in verses 11 to 14. Paul imagines the church, buoyed by the renewed commitment to walk as children of light, while they await Christ's return, in Ephesians 5, verse 8 and 15 and 16, and blessed by the presence of Christ, in verse 14, gathering to worship. As they are motivated by their status as beloved children of God and by Christ's death for them, as expressed in verses 1 and 2, and are filled with the Spirit, as it says in verse 18, their shared worship is characterised by energy and joy as together they sing together praise to their Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father. With a firm grip, On heavenly realities, they celebrate their hope for the future, rooted in the story of what God has done, is doing, and will accomplish through Jesus Christ their Lord, in verses 18 to 20. Understood in this way, the passage becomes far more than a set of disconnected commands about Christian living. It becomes a prophetic call concerning Christian identity, commitment, community and worship in the last days, a pathos-filled invitation to snap up the bargains on offer in the days until Christ's return, in verse 16. And so that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Confronted today with a viral culture that preaches its values 24-7, 365 days a year through a withering array of media, how can believers adopt Paul's high standards? 2. What strategies might believers today employ to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, as it said in verse 10, and to understand what the will of the Lord is in verse 17? And 3. Someone might argue that Paul's ban against speaking of sexual immorality among believers in verses 3 and 4 means that we should not deal with issues of sexual misbehaviour and abuse. Why is that an inappropriate conclusion? And 4. In what ways does our contemporary society reflect similar pagan practices to those that Paul dealt with in his time? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Diapers on the Grocery List by Amy McHenry One Friday morning, I was doing the weekly shopping at our local grocery store in Beirut, Lebanon. My husband, Peter, was buying apples and granola bars for the Pathfinders weekend hike, and I was getting the family food. We serve as missionaries teaching biology at Middle East University. As I went upstairs to get some disinfectant and dish soap, I glanced down the diaper aisle and saw someone looking at diapers. I thought to myself how hard it must be for people who need diapers in Lebanon. 
The financial situation is extremely difficult, with the Lebanese currency having lost more than 90% of its value in two years and the cost of goods skyrocketing. More than 80% of the country lives below the poverty line. Suddenly a command popped into my head, buy a package of diapers. I was surprised at this sudden thought, Lord, is that you? I asked. Why would I buy diapers? The youngest of my three children is 10 years old. Buy a package of diapers. I started to walk toward the escalator. Lord, I don't even know anyone with a baby who needs diapers. The command became more insistent. Buy a package of diapers. I walked back to the diaper aisle and prayed. Okay, Lord, I'll buy some diapers and you'll just have to show me later who they're for. What size should I get? I grabbed a package of size 3 diapers and continued shopping. When my husband and I met at the car, I told him, Don't be surprised if you see a package of diapers in the trunk. The Lord told me to purchase them. They're a gift, but I don't know who they're for yet. We drove home. The next day at church, I saw a friend whose wife works with refugee families in Beirut. We chatted for a while and I asked him, Do you think your wife might know someone who needs diapers? The Lord told me to get some yesterday and I don't know who they're for. He promised to ask her. That evening, I received a text from him. When I told my wife your story about the diapers, she started to cry, he wrote. Tomorrow she will be visiting two families who need diapers. Can we pick them up tonight? A short while later, as we hugged and chatted at the door, I handed her the diapers that God had put on my grocery list. I learned that she works with more than 20 families who need diapers and can't afford them. Now I know to put diapers on my grocery list more often. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel in the Middle East and around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.